Today on Right and Exact, Deshaun Farad speaks with author John Potash about Tupac Shakur and what he feels is an ongoing war being waged against the hip-hop community and black America. We caught up with him at the IHOP in Jessup, Maryland. John Potash, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on your show. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, let's get right to it. John, over 20 years later, 20 year, over 20 years after mm -hmm. the death of Tupac Shakur, his death still remains a hot topic why is that because i think he was such a brilliant um inspiring uh, musician and leader is why uh, he inspired just millions of people with his music and also his, his politics and um and i think people are coming to realize that more and more as a lot of us uh, writers and researchers and media people like yourself are getting the word out there about who he really was in terms of being an activist leader from the age of 17 uh, as head of the new african Pe uh, panthers and um and then becoming a rapper now your book here came out a decade ago mm -hmm. but you said you had spent years already researching for it what I want to know from you is, or what I, I guess we already know the answer to this, but for our audience, what inspired you to begin researching Tupac, if you would, briefly? What inspired you to write this book? Well, I was researching the idea of the second book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, and I um, was counseling someone who said my father was a Black Panther killed by the police. Um, I was using um, him and his father as uh, just loosely as a character in, in a novel based on the idea of drugs as weapons against us. And uh, in researching the New York Black Panthers, I came to find that they were the you know heads of, like Fane Shakur was one time leader of the Harlem Black Panthers. And uh, when I saw that, and they were targeted by the FBI's counterintelligence program for their activist work. And so when I saw in the newspaper foul play around Tupac's life and regarding the police, um, in December of 1994, I started researching uh, him and finding that there was a lot of police foul play against him, similar to his you know, Black Panther parents. And I called his activist lawyer, Michael Warren, and said, do you think they're targeting Tupac like they target his parents? And he said, yes, and no one's writing about it. And he gave me a, a two-hour interview. And I tried to publish that in an article then, um, and I just could only publish it locally in Washington, D.C. in 95, and then finally in 1998, uh, uh, Covert Action Quarterly, a, a magazine started by a CIA whistleblower, uh, published an article uh, when what was I found to be the FBI counterintelligence program targeting of Tupac Shakur for his activism. And it was a latter day version of the counterintelligence program, which they call COINTELPRO, um, because and, uh, basically it was supposedly stopped, officially stopped in 1971. But a CIA, um, FBI whistleblower named M. Wesley Swearing and said they continued it, but under different names. So I noticed in this book, okay, and I've, uh, you know, I've had this book for quite some time. In this book, you mention other people besides uh, besides Tupac. You mention, of mm -hmm. course, his mother, Fanny Shakur. You mention Malcolm X, mm -hmm. Dr. King, uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe uh, that uh, black leadership seems to be so uh, intimidating to the power structure? What, what, what is it about uh, black leadership that it seems to be targeted? And we've seen this for the past several decades, as we uh, as we've seen, of course, according to Freedom of Information Act documents. Mm -hmm. What do you think that's yeah. about in your research? Well, um, I, I, my research has come to find it's based on whistleblower, CIA whistleblower Victor Marchetti, who was probably the highest level CIA whistleblower with his books. Um, he found that he was they wouldn't even allow other Catholics besides himself near the uh, leadership of the CIA. And so um, it was, the, the head of the CIA reflected basically the oligarchical families. The oligarchy are, in, you know, of course, incredibly wealthy, the wealthiest families in the world, but also incredibly racist. So it's a combination of incredible racism and incredible what I call hypercapitalism um, against anything even vaguely socialist. And the Black Panthers, of course, were socialists, but a lot of the uh, black leaders like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were you know leftists will call them uh, lean toward socialism were you know of course against prejudice against war um, and for you know helping the poor 
and helping people, disadvantaged people in general. And it, it was that aspect of them, I think, both their color of their skin, because they're so racist at the top, the oligarchy, plus their, uh, demo, you know, their leftist uh, political ideology that made them a threat to the uh, powers that be. You know, it's amazing that you connect uh, the death of Tupac, as you would say, uh, many of you, along with others, have referred to his death as an assassination. Yeah. But it's amazing that in this book you connect his assassination to Malcolm and King, as, yeah. as well as the, uh, some of the false imprisonments of mm -hmm. others. Uh, how did you make that correlation? Uh, how long was it before you were able to make that correlation? Yeah, well, uh, there was uh, the person who was, well, I'll just start with Saladin Abba Shakur was part of um, Marcus Garvey's group, okay, that Malcolm X's father was part of. And so when Malcolm X rose up to power, uh, he took in um, Saladin Abba Shakur as one of his closest confidants. Zaidin Abba Shakur had two biological sons, um, Lamumba Shakur and Zaid Shakur. Afeni Shakur married Lamumba Shakur. Lamumba Shakur founded the Harlem Black Panthers and Zaid Shakur was one of the co-founders of the uh, Bronx Black Panthers. And so uh, Eugene Roberts was head, rose up to be head of security for Malcolm X. He, it turns out, was working for the FBI's counterintelligence program. And uh, he helped set up Malcolm X's assassination. And that's, that's, I showed all the evidence of that in my book. And so then he also infiltrated the Black Panthers. He followed the Shakurs into the Black Panthers, and he helped set up uh, Faini Shakur and Lumumba Shakur in the Panther 21 trial. But uh, in that trial, they were all found you know, acquitted. They were all found not guilty. But he tried to set them up for imprisonment, the same way he tried to set up the assassination of Malcolm X. That's part of the connection. But I show the same, the same kind of personnel and the same strategies were used against Tupac Shakur and his family as were used against his other great black leaders, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Mumia and others. Now, you know, uh, John, you said something very interesting in this book concerning Malcolm's assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many writers, of course, and many uh, activists often have blamed the Nation of Islam for uh, Malcolm's death, but mm -hmm. I noticed that you mentioned uh, Malcolm's trip abroad when he was poisoned. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little bit about that, uh, if you would. The well, many people don't, most people don't are unaware that he had been poisoned <laughs> after he left the Nation of Islam. Talk, talk yeah, about that. well, uh, Malcolm said he, he trained the security of the Nation of Islam. He trained a lot of uh, people in the Nation of Islam. He was second highest in command, you know, at the Nation of Islam. And so he knew what they could and couldn't do. But when he went to Egypt and uh, he saw this waiter who he recognized from New York, who um, he thinks was the person to blame for his poisoning in Egypt, he thought, well, this is way beyond what the Nation of Islam can do. This, this must not be the Nation of Islam uh, targeting me. This must be the CIA. And many government documents from different countries play that out the way they had Malcolm X under uh, close scrutiny and uh, the way they ended up assassinating him. So you also mentioned, of course, uh, some would say Malcolm X's, uh, if you would, some would say ideological rival, Dr. King. Mm -hmm. What would the United States, out of curiosity, what would the FBI or those who are in power get? What would be the benefit out of, uh, from taking out King and Malcolm, who would that benefit? Malcolm? Well, one of the best researchers on Martha King's assassination is a guy named William Pepper. He had become close friends with Dr. King before he died because Martha King um, saw his pictures and his articles um, uh, that he had written because Pepper was a journalist, went to Vietnam, took pictures and, and wrote about the, basically the atrocities in Vietnam. Uh, Dr. King you know, befriended him. Um, and they end up joining together politically and uh, trying to start a third party actually. But um, so Pepper found that um, that one year, exactly one year before Martin Luther King was assassinated, he made his official announcement against the Vietnam War. And that anniversary date is, is not just coincidental. Um, that seems to be a CIA or an FBI tactic for assassinations. And because uh, he, he laid out all the evidence in, in his about 20 plus years investigation 
of how Martha how the US you know US intelligence on behalf of the oligarchy assassinated Martha King at least partly if not you know majorly because of his uh, official opposition to the Vietnam War. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, your second book, okay, uh, Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say drugs as weapons against us, talk to us a little bit about that. Give us a snapshot, if you would. Sure. How are drugs being used against us? Well, um... And you mentioned different celebrities. This, this book seems to focus sure. on celebrities more so than activists. Well, it focuses on both because it focuses on the Black Panthers and the Students for Democratic Society. But um, sure, it draws people in with the celebrities because I, I show that there was a program, the CIA program called uh, Project MK Ultra, and um, that project had about 150 subprojects, according to federal documents. And uh, that that program, MK Ultra, was the, you know the documents say the use of drugs as unconventional warfare. Now most people think of warfare as in foreign lands, war in another country, but I show that that warfare uh, was against our its own you know, our own populace, against people that dissented against whatever the oligarchy wanted to happen in the U.S. So they used um, drugs as, as weapons against civil rights leaders like the great Paul Robeson, one of those you know, incredible men of the, in, the war, in history. Wait a minute, so they had Robeson strung out on drugs as well, you're no, saying? Okay. They, they dosed, they put acid, like a super hallucinogen, either acid or BZ, which was a super strong psychedelic, in Paul Robeson's drink in uh, Moscow uh, a few weeks before he was supposed to meet with Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. And that was about when the Bay of Pigs was supposed to occur, okay, the U.S. invasion of, of, of uh, Cuba after the revolution. And so they, they dosed him with the super psych, either LSD, a lot of LSD, or BZ, made him think he's going crazy. This is 1961, people didn't know about acid and other psychedelics at that time. Made, think, made him think he's going crazy. Then he, uh, he called his family. Um, his son, Paul Robeson Jr., came over to see what was going on. They, they dosed Paul Robeson Jr.'s drink, and he talks about this in a long lecture. And uh, and so they targeted him, and then they, they convinced the family to let him go into a uh, medical facility where they gave him over 50 high-dose ECT treatments, like the convulsive shock treatments, to permanently mess up his mind. So that's just one example of how they use drugs as weapons against our great activist leaders. You know, other examples are is their use against the, the uh, anti-war leaders of the Students for Democratic Society, as well as, of course, um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were anti-war, um, held anti-war rallies, and, uh, and against the, you know, I, I would argue against the Kennedys, too, because the, the Vietnam War was the war over the control of the area of the Golden Triangle which is the best place in the world to produce poppies. You know, they have the largest poppy fields in the Golden Triangle near Vietnam, in Laos and Burma and all that area. Um, the second best place to produce uh, poppies and poppy, uh, the poppy fields is along the same mountain range, the other end of that same mountain range, which uh, ends in Afghanistan. And I would argue that it's no coincidence that the two longest wars in U.S. history we're in Vietnam and Afghanistan, the two ends of the same mountain range, which is the best area in the world to produce poppies, which produce opium and heroin. And so that's that's part of the big reason for the, those wars. So was there any truth, uh, in your view, to what Rick Ross and Gary Webb were saying concerning uh, CIA involvement in flooding black communities with, with uh, crack cocaine? Oh yeah, I mean, the Inspector General of the CIA confirmed that the CIA was trafficking uh, cocaine. Um, so it's been confirmed. That was said in the Washington Post, and I show, you know, I quote them in my in my book, uh, the Washington Post in there. And so, um, yes, I mean, I, there's loads of evidence to support. Not only, I mean, you know, it's it's pretty direct that the CIA was trafficking the cocaine. That's there's way too much evidence and too much uh, official acknowledgement of that. It's the fact of were they targeting in the black communities? And I show that there's loads of evidence that yes, they were targeting uh, cocaine into the black communities in the same way they were targeting heroin into the black communities and communities of color in the 1960s. Yeah. Now I'm noticing that uh, the difference between this book uh -huh. and your first book, of course, you mentioned in the first book mm -hmm. the FBI or the government targeting black leadership. Mm -hmm. But I'm noticing in this book you mentioned 
you mentioned certain activists who are outside of the black community. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for anyone you know accusing you of being a, a racial conspiracy theorist, I'm noticing that you mm -hmm. uh, are you saying though that although they were primarily targeting black people, you said they're the, the racist oligarchs. Yeah. What would they get out of targeting? John F. Kennedy white, and Robert white, F. White Kennedy. White activists or white anti war. What would they get out of that? What would their well, purpose for going after them? Well, JFK and RFK were incredibly progressive in their politics in terms of, uh, you know, changing, you know, uh, JFK was pulling out of Vietnam. I sh much evidence shows he was pulling out of Vietnam. RFK wanted to end the Vietnam War. And, uh, and they were very progressive about civil rights uh, legislation. You know, and uh, people might argue that, but uh, you know, I show a lot of, of how that was happening. You know, um, RFK even uh, made in treaties, according to William Pepper, made in treaties to, to Martin Luther King to, that he would like him to be his uh, vice presidential candidate when he was, you know, it would look for sure that he was going to win the uh, you know, presidential nomination as the Democratic, you know, front runner. So there was going to be an alliance between the between Kennedy, uh, RFK and, and King. King. Yeah, according to William Pepper, yes, it was he was close associate of, of Martha King's, and also worked on RFK's campaign. And so yes, um, so they were very progressive, and as was John Lennon, you know, um, very anti-war, very progressive in his politics, what, what? and Kurt Cobain, and that's why I, I show that they now with the musicians though, the musicians I argue were manipulated in order to promote drugs, but then when they started to sober up and get more into activism, they were done away with it. What got me was Janis Joplin, who you mentioned. Sure. And I would never think, uh, many people would never think that Janis Joplin would be in that category to be, quote, targeted. Yeah. So what was it about Janis, uh, uh, was it her charisma? Well, she was very charismatic. Was it about, what was it about her that they attempted, to, as, as you say, manipulate? Yeah, well, they found that, I mean, she had, Janis Joplin had incredible talent as a singer. She, everyone who heard her, said that from the start so um, her first you know boyfriend slash fiance her first her fiance um, told uh, someone else that he was actually working undercover for the FBI and uh, uh, you know in evidence of, of all of his activities show that he was undercover for the FBI um, and he, he's the one that strung out or strung out on speed at first and then other, I, I argue, other undercover agents got her strung out on heroin when she was trying to sober up and she had uh, uh, said in, on t national television that she was going to be part of two unprecedented national peace conferences, concerts at, uh, in New York and Philadelphia, two you know, baseball stadiums. Um, she was then given, I argue, was given a hot shot there after where she, they gave her overly pure heroin that killed her. And of course you mentioned uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Jimmy Hendrix. Now, what was it about? About, of course, uh, uh, some people I'm not sure may know the answer to that. But from yeah. your perspective, what was it about Hendrix? Well, Jimmy Hendrix, uh, according to the top biographers on him, said that he had actually given up drugs, uh, most you know, psychedelics and other, and, and never gotten into heroin, and it was only dabbled in in uh, any other drugs. Um, but was not into hard drugs. In the end of his life, he he just smoked a little weed and drank a little at the end of his life. And uh, a person, though, had entered his life when he was getting big and couldn't handle all the fame in England, and that was a guy named Mike Jeffrey. Mike Jeffrey uh, said he was former British MI6, which is you know the British version of the CIA. And all the evidence shows that he continued to do uh, be an MI6 agent undercover and to manipulate Hendrix and sabotage any kind of activism he tried to do. So it's when when Hendrix started dedicating his last album to the Black Panthers. And quoted, you know, the need to support the Panthers in interviews. He was a he was a threat at that point, and so Mike Jeffrey even confessed to uh, a roadie who came up the book several years ago, James Tappy Wright, that he had Mike uh, Jimi Hendrix killed. So, and um, James Tappy Wright just quote, you know, was quoted in, in his memoirs several years ago about that. Okay, now back to uh, your first book. Now mm -hmm. you have a film companion to it. Mm -hmm. As we can see now, yeah. how is this different from the book, or what does it go into that the book doesn't go into? Well, the film that is the same title as the book, that I wore on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, uh, shows a lot of the uh, government documents, um, a lot of the book and uh, evidence, and the you know, magazine article evidence, the court documents, and you know, it shows a lot of my source material that I you know have in my book. Of course, the book is is. Um, 
much longer. You know, it's got over a thousand end notes, documented sources also. But um, the film just shows more of, of that pictorial evidence along with the narration telling the, the story. But the, the, the narration is about only 40 pages long, um, which comes out to about an hour and a half film, you know, documentary film. Um, so it doesn't tell as much information, but it gives a good condensation of the book in terms of what, of what really happened. The fact that Tupac was, um, you know, a, a national black leader as head of the New African Panthers at 17, 18 years old. Then he became a rapper, was putting out political uh, lyrics at first, um, and he was targeted, I argue, uh, four or five times for assassination before he was actually killed, okay? When he put out his first album, um, he was stopped by Oakland police, allegedly for jaywalking, and they proceeded to bang his head against the curb and choke him unconscious. Two things that I found that caused people to die in police custody before, okay? Then you have the Marin Fest, where police were watching as strangers came up to Tupac. He was an honorary guest at the Marin, Marin Fest. Um, they came up to Tupac and punched him for no reason and then shot at him, according to best evidence that I you know, have in my book and film. And then you get to the uh, Atlanta incident, where um, all the best, I, the witnesses, the eyewitnesses that I interviewed said that what happened was Tupac was in his car when these allegedly off-duty white police officers wearing plain clothes were beating up a black man right in front of Tupac's car. Tupac just rolled down his window, said, what's going on? They proceeded to run up to his car, smash his car window with a gun that they had stolen from a police evidence locker, which they call a throwaway gun in case you kill someone you don't want to trace back to you. They shoot at him, according to eyewitnesses. Tupac merely rolls out the back, grabs a guard's gun from the car following him, and shoots back in self-defense, shooting them in the butt and legs as they're running away with their gun still pointed at him. Then you get to the uh, New York City uh, music studio incident where p um, gunmen proceed to supposedly you know, uh, rob Tupac in the Quad Studios in t around Times Square. And what they proceed to do, though, is put one bullet in to put him down on the ground and then put two bullets in the back of his skull. And according to a doctor's affidavit, which I have a copy of in my book that was presented in court, two bullets went in the back of his skull and came out the front of his skull, miraculously missing his brain. It, so, was, it was an absolute miracle that he survived that assassination attempt. Now, when you, now if I may, uh, John, when you say sure. assassination attempts, you said three times. At least you said you believe three times. Th th three assassination attempts. You uh, said. Yeah. Uh, the really, reason, the uh, reason, yeah. Sure. Go the on. The reason why I'm asking is that in your studies, did they have the signs of an assassination? In other yes. words. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Did, uh, oh, all the signs. signs of, a, yes. of a professional hit. In yes. other words. Yes. All the signs of a professional hit. Um, so, it, for example, in the New York recording studio lobby, when they put the bullets in the back of his skull and came out the front of his skull, obviously they were trying to kill him. Um, you had the police come up afterwards, the security guard at, who works at the Quad Studio says, here's the video footage, surveillance video of the incident. The police turned it down and, and closed the case. So police did not want to find out who these people were, you know, uh, who really killed, you know, were trying to kill Tupac. Um, a guy named Dexter Isaac said he was paid to, to shoot Tupac. He's, he was in prison, he confessed to being paid. Did he say and he was paid by J James Henchman Rosemont. James H Henchman Rosemont um, had already he had signed an agreement around that time, around the, you know, the mid-90s period, to be an informant for the government, you know, that he, he would be let off of, of all different kinds of crimes if he did work for the government. So um, that's just some of the evidence that, yes, that was an uh, assassination attempt you know, number three or four, you could argue. Now, did you have any difficulty obtaining records from the Freedom of Information Act? Did I you, did. Any roadblock to you? Yeah, yeah, so I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for Tupac's FBI file in 1999. It took a year for them to respond to me, and they, they said, um, I said, well, how many pages am I paying for to get it all copied? She says, well, I'm not allowed to tell you that. And then we talked for a lot longer, and she uh, disclosed that there was over 4,000 pages in this FBI file that would cost 10 cents a page to copy them for me. And um, so then they sent me a letter saying, you're going to have to pay uh, $405 to get Tupac's FBI file. And that, of course, equals to 4,050 pages. And so I paid for them. And I show a copy of that Justice Department, you know, FBI Justice Department letter in my book and um, proving that. And so 
then they sent me only 99 of those pages and they used all kinds of excuses for why but even those 99 pages were heavily deleted I'm about to ask you any, any any blank outs yeah, because we many blank outs even in that many you know it's heavily redacted yes now the movie that mm -hmm. uh, recently or that came out this year what are your yeah. thoughts about the movie did it go further did it go far enough uh, in dealing with why he was taken out uh, in your judgment what, are you, what is your view yeah. concerning the movie yeah, well, I think the movie, um, considering it's a major motion picture and over 2,000 you know, screens around the country, I think it did a pretty good job of at least putting uh, into people's minds the fact that there was a target on his back for being a national black leader. And um, yeah, they didn't cover the New African Panther leadership that, that you know, Tupac was involved with. They didn't cover the... Um, you know, some of the exact ways I described the attempts on his life and things like that. But they, they covered enough, I thought, to put that in people's minds, which I thought was very important. Um, they didn't cover the fact that Tupac's uh, business manager was Watani Tayahimba, who was um, co-founding uh, security director for the New African People's Organization, which was originally founded, you know, and he was a former Black Panther. And that was Tupac's longtime business manager, Naitron Gregory, like they say in the movie. And Tupac's national legal advisor was Chokwe Lumumba, who was the founding national chairman of the New African People's Organization. And so Tupac was funding um, a great, you know, black leadership um, on the side of his, you know, of his own work. And so Tupac, at some point, when, around the time of his first album, he decided to take on a new plan, which was he called the Thug Life Plan, which was partly developed with his uh, stepfather, Matulu Shakur, great black leader who was falsely imprisoned, I argue, and should have been let out in 2016. His sentence was done in 2016. They kept him in prison beyond his sentence anyway. But um, their thug life plan was for Tupac to pretend to be a gangster and were to appeal to gangs and politicize them. And this comes from Watai Tanyahimba and Shoki Lamumba, I talked to about this, but Watai in particular is still alive. But um, so the thug life plan was part of Tupac's Black Panther extended families getting the Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles to call peace truces and turn on to activism. And that was spreading across Los Angeles, then across California, and then across the country. And that was a major threat to U.S. intelligence, who wanted them to keep dealing drugs and keep killing each other and cause dis you know, keep the dissension going in the black community. And so Tupac was uh, creating peace, more peace in the black community. And but uh, you know, again, this gangster facade he was putting on uh, just had him kind of uh, misunderstood for who he really was, which was an uh, intellectual prodigy. I mean, he rewrote Shakespeare plays in high school and would uh, and even a book, of, a book of poetry when he was 15, yeah. I believe, a book yeah, of poetry. Yeah, I mean, before he was out of his teen years, he was reading hundreds of PhD level books. Um, you know, according to many researchers who showed his library, the library that Leila Steinberg kept for him. But he, uh, yeah, he re rewrote Shakespeare in modern language, um, acted in and produced it in, you know, in high schools. He was just a total, you know, pro intellectual prodigy, a brilliant man. And uh, it's too bad that he just wasn't uh, as well understood that way for what he really, you know, was and was capable of. Well, it's, a, you know, it's amazing you, uh, you have, you have uh touched on something uh, you were speaking about uh, you know his uh, intellectual mm -hmm. uh, him being an intellectual prodigy yeah. it's something something Tupac had said he said that I didn't have a record until I produced the record until I right. made a record right. that, that's that's what this, this is actually uh, reminding me of once he yeah uh, you know that's that, yeah that's yeah I mean once he gained wealth and fame um, you know, then they started targeting him. Once he started adding wealth and fame to his activism, they started targeting him in more and more sophisticated ways uh, in relation to his increasing wealth and fame. Okay, so as we conclude, uh, and I have maybe one, one or two more questions after this, or one or two more subjects, do you feel that had Tupac lived, he would have been on the level of a Malcolm or King? No do you, doubt. Do you feel he was evolving to that? Um, I think he, he intellectually was already there. Um, I just think in, in his total presentation, yes, he, he would have he would have been that for sure. And once he got away from that, that you know gangster persona, he was which was part of that political plan. Um, yes, he could have been uh, easily been uh, you know a Malcolm X, Martin Luther King type of figure. Um, you know, you know, you just um, I'll just say one more thing though is the fact that 
while he, when he was in jail, they used penal coercion tactics, which Amnesty International calls his closest thing. They have to brainwashing to mess his head up as much as possible, so that it got him to, to sign the death row records for one thing, and to uh, actually believe this this uh, that Biggie might have something to do with his setup or or you know shooting now, now in hold New on, York. Wait a minute. So he was coerced to sign. You say wait a minute. So coerced to sign the death row records. What, yes. But you know what? I, you know what, uh, John. I, was a, like a front organization set up by U.S. Yes. intelligence. Yes. So you're saying, so I'm sorry, you just, uh, listen, you, uh, please, high, please yeah. go a little bit into that. I don't sure. want to keep you. I'm sorry. A high level police detective named Russell Poole was assigned to Biggie Small's murder investigation. And when he found dozens of his fellow police officers working on all levels of death row records, he asked his superiors, what are they doing there? And this is a quote from the book Labyrinth by veteran uh, journalist Randall Sullivan. Which is being made in a movie now, you know, with um, I believe it's Johnny Depp or um, playing Randall, playing Russell Poole. So Russell Poole it gets tells the superiors, you know, they all, you know, what are these dozens of fellow police officers in Los Angeles doing in Death Row Records? And he says you can call them uh, troubleshooters or covert agents. Is the direct quote. Okay, so that's just some of the much, you know, the multitudes of evidence that Death Row Records was a U.S. intelligence front company. They were trafficking drugs, they were trafficking guns, and they were trying to end the Bloods versus Crips peace truces that Tupac had helped uh, engender, you know, across the country and the Black Panthers had helped engender. So what would they get out of coercing Pac into uh, signing a, a contract with Death Row? What would they get out of that? Well, they could produce his most negative lyrics he ever produced, which you could see on All Eyes on Me, you know, promoting weed as much as possible and, al and alcohol, and, and also um, promoting, you know, drug dealing more, but also creating that East West, East Coast versus West Coast battle between, you know, Death Row and, uh, you know, and Bad Boy and, you know, Tupac and Biggie. And they use the same tactics to engender that as they did against, you know, Black Panther leaders on the East and West Coast. So you see the same tactics, counterintelligence program tactics being used. And, um, and so, you know, that, that was part of it. And so they did actually end the Bloods versus Crips peace truce when Tupac was in the hospital dying for six days. And there was many murders between the Bloods and Crips. The Suge Knight uh, ordered, and Dave Kenner ordered loads of guns shipped to, to the Bloods, crates of, of AKs shipped to the Bloods. The war started again. There was a lot of a lot of killing um, because they told the you know, Bloods that the Crips killed Tupac. And um, but after Tupac died, activists got the word out that they don't think that it, the Crips actually killed Tupac, and they stopped that war and they got the peace going again between the Bloods and Crips. Okay, so as we conclude, um, do you feel that the hip hop and rap community is still being targeted by uh, members of our government? Yes. Definitely. No. Um, you know, yeah, they, they have a, um, you know, it's been shown that they have a hip-hop task force. Um, I was going to mention that the hip-hop is a book. Yeah, yeah, it's federally run. Now, now, part of that, you know, book and film is part cover-up, but there's some truth. If you see, the, uh, you know, a film about that, you can see some of the truths that they have in there that it is federally run. It did target loads of rappers. I talked to some of these rappers' lawyers, and I quote them in my book, you know, FBI Warren Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, that they were framed. They were, they were, evidence was made up, evidence was hidden, evidence was, you know, just a frame. Any of these rappers that started getting political joined the, uh, the hip hop um, action uh, network. I'm sorry, it was called uh, Hassan, hip, the Hip Hop Summit, Summit Action Network, which was started by Russell Simmons. Um, who said that Tupac was actually sobering up in his last months and stopped smoking weed and stopped drinking, you know, he saw him at parties just dancing all night while everyone else was smoking weed and drinking and he wasn't, wasn't touching anything. He was in, Tupac was engaged to Katie Jones, Quincy Jones' daughter. They were planning to have a baby and he was, you know, stopped going to strip clubs and doing other things like that. Um, but anyway, so Russell Simmons started this Hip Hop, Hip -hop Summit Action Network. They had top rappers involved, they had uh, top black activists involved, Professor Manning Marable, who's a democratic socialist, um, Kwaizi Mfume, who was uh, head of the that, that Black National Congress. You know, that was in, I think, uh, Minister so. Farrakhan, he noted that that was in 2001, when they had that, it was gotcha. a major rap battle. Yeah, so, so yeah, there was a lot of black leaders involved in that, in, in turning, you know, uh, you know, activists on to, you know, rappers on to activism. And uh, getting the black community to, to to get into this, you know, back into this activist mode, 
And they, you know, people said there that their 12-point program was similar to the Black Panthers' 10-point program. Actually, I mean, of course, it didn't go as far as Black Panthers' 10-point program, but it was similar. And so, uh, they were, any of these black, uh, rappers that start getting involved in that were targeted in major ways and were scared away from activism. And so that's how it continued, partly, and in, in other ways too. Though. Well, John Patash, we uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you know, we uh, we wish you much success. Well, and thanks. If you would, uh, would you like to? Uh, you can tell our audience where they can find some of your stuff. Sure. Um, uh, my website is uh, FBI www.fbiwaronetupac.com, where you can. Uh, it's also titled Drugs as Weapons .com. but uh, that's where they can find. Um, you know, just talk to me or uh, get my book or film directly from me. My books are filmed directly from me, or you can get on Amazon.com, or uh, you can see my second book because it's uh, with a larger publisher at, at uh, you know, Barnes and Nobles around the country. And uh, the FBI won to Bach.com is at some uh, independent bookstores around the country, too. Right, we thank you very much for joining Thanks us. Thanks so much for having me on, Deshaun. And we thank you very much for joining us. Please don't forget to subscribe to yourblackworld.net. I'm your host, Dashaun Farad. See you next time. Thank you for joining us.